Now we'll have a session where you can dive deeper into their thoughts. I'd like to invite the five speakers to the stage. Please join me in welcoming to the stage. all our speakers back to the stage. Um, what we're going to do now is to have a conversation so we can explore in, in a little more depth some of the um, ideas and, and projects that were discussed. And I'd like to begin with chicken soup, um, <laughs> because I think Eve's metaphor is very apt for the moment um, we find ourselves in, because we are in a kind of a soup. <laughs> um, uh, some of it is toxic, uh, some of it is healthy, um, Zainab earlier today also used a food metaphor and for how <laughs> uh, social media can be uh, positive or, or, or negative. And I'd like to be, begin by asking each of the, the presenters, um, taking Eve's analogy a bit further, um, they are each um, suggesting that uh, traditional, traditional understandings of journalism, kind of mindlessly breaking the bones, as we have been for, for, for generations, um, perhaps is not equal to the task uh, at hand. And interestingly, in each of the presentations, a traditional understanding of, of journalism um, kind of takes a back seat uh, to social interaction and conversations. Um, for um, Ethan, the user, uh, him or herself is in control, and for Kareem, it's an individual experience. And for Young and for Eve, journalism has a kind of moderating influence. And journalism is not a gatekeeper, as, as has been the case in the past. So I just want to ask each of you, and starting with, with you, Young, if I, if I may, um, if the, the gatekeeping function of journalism and nonfiction storytelling more generally no longer applies, what is the proper, most helpful role for, for journalism in in creating communities that can communicate. As I said in my presentation, journalism is uh, creating stories for our communities, and that's its role. In a civic society, citizens enabled to have a productive dialogue and talk with each other, journalism, journalism has a role to play. And uh, journalism needs to provide uh, good news and uh, produce uh, good information. Because uh, offline and online, in the everyday conversations of the citizens, they get uh, the topic of their conversations uh, from news. And uh, it's from news that uh, they uh, carry out a dialogue with each other. And news can also uh, be a catalyst for conversation. And that is why the quality of news uh, can uh, decide the quality of the conversation of the civil society. And so I believe that uh, journalism will need to provide quality news. And thanks to the production of quality news, it will enable uh, Koreans and citizens to uh, communicate in a good way. Eve, do you want to address that? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of elements to, to dialogue journalism that are really about deconstructing the journalistic process and thinking about how to take each element of, of traditional practice and do it, do it differently. But one of the things that, um, that really excites me and I think it's really valuable and maybe applicable in lots of contexts is this idea of thinking of story as starting, starting in the conversation. What are people talking about? What are people asking about directly? So instead of it being me in my office saying, this is the story that people need to hear, it's what are people talking about and how can we give them information right then in real time that undergirds a conversation that, so that people have what they need, what they need and it's driven by their, their feelings and their what's happening in their space rather than my head. Mm -hmm. So James, I, I wonder if it's still helpful to consider journalism as an entity. <laughs> uh, I, 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 the way that I've started to think about these things is as a very complex ecosystem. And journalists are one of the key um, species in that ecosystem. 
Uh, but social media users are incredibly important. The social media platforms are incredibly important as well. And the interactions between the two um, is where an enormous amount of power comes from. Um, journalists now rely on social media to find audiences for their stories. Uh, social media users use amplification as a political force. And so a new form of citizenship is to say, I like your story, I'm going to amplify it, or I dislike your story and I'm going to try to push it down. I, I think we need to look at that as an entity. And I'm not sure that it's the journalists who are doing the gatekeeping anymore. I think it's that interface between the journalism and the social media uh, where an enormous amount of that gatekeeping is occurring. Mm -hmm. Karen? I think the gatekeeping process has been too long in the same hands, perhaps. And we live in a very different world today. And I wonder if the, this gatekeeping process is not part of the problem as, and to explain how we ended up where we are. And if you look at um, magazines um, and newspapers, they often work along partisan line more and more. Mm -hmm. And it's not what we've heard. I and mean, when I started, it's not what I heard journalism should be. Journalism should be in the middle and taking all um, accounts into consideration. Um, and I'm wondering if, 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 if just moving a bit the gatekeeping process today is not allowing more voice and, as Eve says, bringing you know, the communities in the center. Mm -hmm. So I guess to use your ecosystem uh, metaphor, Ethan, Ethan the, I guess journalism, nonfiction storytelling is trying to find, from being at the top of the food chain, um, perhaps nonfiction storytelling journalism finds itself also the prey for, for larger uh, entities. But I think it's the, the role of factual information and how that gets amplified on, on social media. And uh, as, as Young was saying, uh, journalists being the traditional providers of that mm -hmm. kind of objective uh, or at least factual uh, information, how does that get the kind of amplification that misinformation or partisan, sure. partisan information gets? It's interesting. When you, when you have this conversation with journalists, there's always a certain amount of nostalgia <laughs> for a world in which facts were concrete things that we could hold on to and were reported and they would anchor our debate. The downside of this is that at that moment in journalism, um, you also had a lot of underrepresentation. Mm -hmm. um, at that same moment in the US where we had a small number of widely trusted voices. We had very few black people, Asian people, Latin people, very few women whose voices were out there as well. So we need to be careful of the nostalgia at the same time as we sort of look for the anchors. So because there isn't a monopoly on truth and, and even though journalism as a discipline of verification has a very powerful set of tools to get to truth, they're not the only truths. Some of those underrepresented truths are enormously important as well. Absolutely. What I do think we need to understand is what are the dynamics in this ecosystem? And we're starting to understand some of them. If something is very angry and very passionate, it moves very quickly. And so if you see something moving very quickly, you might want to be very cautious <laughs> about whether it's actually true or whether it's simply passionate. Those are the dynamics that I think we actually need to study and sort of learn to understand. And, and frankly, as someone who does a lot of quantitative study in this field, we're very, very early on understanding how this new medium works. Mm -hmm. Before I prescribe anything about how it should work, I really want to understand how it actually works now. Mm -hmm. um, Young, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your um, study on Cacao Talk. Um, to, to Ethan's point um, about things that are um, partisan or emotion laden spreading very, very quickly, you had an interesting um, study where you tried to introduce, to essentially slow things down, um, in part by introducing 
um, factual information to a, a moderated conversation. And I'm wondering if you could just briefly describe the, the research that you did and the, and the result that you <laughs> achieved. The, yes. Um, just as Ethan mentioned, in social media, there are many different possibilities. We're here together, and we've been talking about social media a lot. And as uh, was said, there are sometimes misinformation that is spread, and people don't listen to each other. They dramatize their own opinion. But there are other possibilities in the social media domain, and we need to be a little bit more active to make that happen. I'd like to talk about my recent study in that respect. In Korea, there's a very popular mobile messenger platform, and it uses an open chat room. So I use that open chat room uh, to conduct an experiment. One of the hot issue is a gender issue in Korea, and another was about abortion and uh, what sort of terms would provide good online uh, debate. What were the conditions under which the open debates took place? And we looked at the script and analyzed the script on the debate about abortion. When there is an anonymous debate online, then the debate uh, participants do get set in some sort of hierarchy. And there's a difference in terms of character and the capacity to debate. So we thought we would be mediators to make up for that difference. But in the end, we found out that without any active intervention, the debate could go on. But rather than this kind of debate, if there was an intermediator, that provided equal opportunity to people, gave them, them the same time to talk. People tended to listen to each other more closely. So there are many different possibilities in social media. It's important to have opinions exchange on the social media, but it has to be exchanged under a fair rule. That was what we got out of our study. Nobody should dominate the conversation, and nobody should own the conversation, and we need to act actively intervene so that that does not happen. So we do have to design the social media to enable this. And that means that talking and listening has to strike a harmony and balance. We have to understand the other position, and that will allow us to better communicate. I think that speaks to Ethan's point about equal representation for different points of view, different groups. I'm just curious, Eve, if that corresponds to your experience with the um, so, because you do these kind of interactions both digitally and in person, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that sense of being heard and how that affects the debate. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like we've found the same sorts of, of things in, in the conversations we've hosted and the work we've done. But it's interesting to, to marry that with your presentation about platforms and, and social media platforms and what we want them to look like. And one of the um, things we found, we've done a lot of hosting of conversations on Facebook because for a lot of reasons people are there, they know how to use it, it's easy to access, it's familiar. But one of the things we have is a, as we think about where we're going to host conversations in the future is a fantasy list of features. And one of them is, to your point about speed, is to, no, it was your point about speed, but is to slow things down. So like, if people are typing fast and comments are coming fast and furious, that's almost always a sign that, that passions are high and people aren't going to be as careful or as thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I th yes, I, I want to say we've, we found those same sort of things. And I think there's a huge amount we can do with our platforms to support really substantive, thoughtful, meaningful, respectful dialogue. And one of your colleagues in the video um, said something about when a moment like that occurs, that's when the journalists say, oh, let's do some reporting. Could you just talk about when and how you decide to interject yeah, actual so, journalistic information? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a process and it changes with every conversation, but the, the, the thinking behind it is, um, is that people need a shared set of facts to talk about, and, and facts are tricky, and we could talk at length about what is a fact, but you, know, we, we, there, you can sort of get there. And so um, what we do is when people, it's a way of slowing things down, and it's a way of finding um, common ground, like, hey, you guys are you guys are debating about 
uh, I don't know, abortion rates in a state or something. We can actually find that information. Um, and so we, we look for places where there's tension and where there's um, divides, but we also, it is a tool to, to, to change, change the frame of the conversation. Mm. So, Kareem, in, in, in your work, you, um, and you spoke eloquently about your frustration with conventional photojournalism and the conventional way that uh, conflict is presented in, in the media, and you um, go even beyond a conversation and try to put the, the user, the audience, the news consumer, the experienced consumer inside um, the conflict without um, any kind of mediation. So, and I, w I wanted to ask if you could answer the question you posed in your speech, what happens when traditional forms of journalism become experiential? What is the uh, effect that you've observed on um, audiences? I've, I've, I've witnessed a level of engagement that is very, very different from traditional media. Um, I've witnessed conversation that starts directly after the experience. Um, I've, I've witnessed change in perceptions. I would love to tell you that the change is permanent, but I don't have the data for this. Um, so I'm not saying that new media such as VR or augmented reality are the solution and we should go ahead with this. I think they are interesting enough that we need to explore more. Um, and they hold a premises that you could start understanding things differently. But I'm putting people indeed in between two different rhetoric and two different point of view. And I'm not saying who's right and who's wrong. I let the people think for themselves. And I think often journalism is trying to tell the people what they should think. Um, and, and it's always more deep, in, probably in the way you remember, when you came to the conclusion on your own, rather than being told what to think. Mm. Um, and this is where the critical minds is in place or start to be triggered. And, uh, and ultimately, I think journalism needs to be able to bring, when it's lacking, a critical mind and to, and to be the grain of salt in the story you didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I'm trying to do this, but I don't have more answers as the efficiency of this and, and, and the length of the change. Yeah, well, that's interesting because there's a couple theories about why people fall for misinformation or believe fake news. And, and one is partisanship, that pe confirmation bias, as you, you mentioned, Young. But another one is just kind of they're plain lazy, <laughs> cognitively lazy. Cognitive laziness, I think, is, is the term. Um, so in that context, you're forcing them, as you said, to think critically, but to um, arrive at the decision or the, or the point of view on their yeah, own. But um, it's also a very different kind of journalism. I mean, you understood you need to walk. But think about what journalism is still up to today. You turn the radio and then you listen. You're comfortable in your car, in your kitchen. Mm. You're up, where do you open a magazine or a newspaper? When you're sitting comfortably. It's a passive action. Where do you turn your TV on? In your living room or if you have a TV in your, in your sleeping room, in your sleeping room, <laughs> and then you turn it on, and then you get fed. I'm thinking that when journalism is active, when you walk a space, when you need to make your own call, it becomes a very different, and without even using the word experiential, it becomes a very different kind of journalism where you make your own choice, yet in my work everything is hard-coded. You're just triggering along your walk what is happening and what you're going to be discovering. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is a very interesting way to look at journalism because this is breaking a lot of boundaries. And it's also forcing um, the visitor or the, the, the reader, or I don't know how we call it in this case, right. uh, <laughs> to think and to make choices and not just to be fed an information that often falls under a partisan line. Ethan. But I, I think there's a lot of different ways for journalism to be experiential. Mm -hmm. So you've created a very physical experience, you're really replicating that experience of being sort of face to face. I think in many ways, when you look at people who are consuming journalism and then using social media to amplify it or share it, 
they're taking what could be a very passive experience and making it a very active experience. You have to read this story. It gives you a perspective that you aren't otherwise seeing. You see lots of people saying, why aren't people telling this story? Why aren't people sharing this piece of information? I actually think it moves people from the passive side to the active side. Now, that can be very negative. I think some of those people who end up spreading disinformation, so it's misinformation when you don't know it's wrong, it's disinformation if you know it's wrong. Many of the people who spread misinformation think that they are trying to counter narratives out there that are incorrect. They see it as their civic duty to spread this information, which turns out to be misinformation. That's a dynamic that we're going to have to understand better, but I don't think the solution to that dynamic is to make us passive again. I actually think that activity of saying, I want to make change in the world, and I'm going to make change through sharing media, I think that's very positive. Trying to figure out how we harness that and how we use it in really constructive ways, for instance, the way that you're using it, um, I, I think that's a, that's a great dimension for us. But it's also interesting because there's a kind of passivity to our clicking and sharing, too. It's a, it's a little more active than sitting and reading a paper, but it's if I like, or, and how many times do people share because of the headline, or mm -hmm. they share because their cousin shared. I mean, it, there's a, it's, it is an action, yeah. but it's not a, a deep action, I don't think. And I think that's the kind of conversation, the work that mm. we're all doing that's driving towards a deeper action. That, that motivates change in some way. Young, in your Cacao Talk um, um, work, what were the factors that, and I think the term that you use is uh, reason giving, people felt compelled to present reasons for their opinions. Mm -hmm. What were the factors in the discussion that prompted that kind of response? I think that uh, not only the panelists here, but everyone here, they know that when we uh, talk, instead of trying to uh, deliver my opinion, we try to rationalize why I'm thinking like this, and we uh, think that that's what we need to do. When we uh, talk with others, in order to improve the quality of communication and our dialogue, we have to be responsible for the explanations we are giving. We have to be accountable for our explanations. Our questions and answers uh, was focusing on uh, this accountability and uh, what rationale they gave. And uh, social media and journalism, we thought about how they could be changed based on these principles. I think that reason giving is important because when I believe something, I need to explain why I believe this, and when I give my rationale, I am accountable, and I'm trying to convey this to the other person, and I can ask that the other person gives me the same explanation, and the other person will be ready to listen to me if I provide this rationale. So speaking in a rational way and Taking the habit of speaking with a rationale is the principle of reciprocity, is the principle of respecting the other, and that is a very important starting point. And I think we need to think about how we can do that. And I think um, your work is similar to Eve's again in the sense that, and I think you said it in your presentation, Eve, that the goal is not to change people's minds, but to, and some of the, the people who participated spoke yeah. eloquently about feeling like they have been heard uh, and they have been understood, but also gaining a, a better understanding of, of others. And in Young's work as well, the goal is not to mm. convince someone of something in which they don't believe, but so what is the goal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of goals, right? But how to help people get beyond, out of sort of their package talking points, right? The, the sort of regurgitation almost of, of what, what has been said elsewhere and what is being repeated and what their friends are saying and to try to, to get below that. And so we don't think of it in terms of rational. We tend to think of um, about getting to their story. Why do they hold this belief? Why is it important to them? But um, 
So I, I would say one of the goals is just to interrupt that, that cycle of, of repetition that's not authentic, that's not real, and that, and that keeps us apart, right? That doesn't help us find, come together. The goal in our work, and, and I want to say there's, you know, I think there's so many different ways to practice journalism, right? And some people say to me all the time, what you're doing isn't journalism, and I have a lot of reasons why it is, and I think people say that to Kareem as well. Um, but I think, you know, I think of journalism at, this, at the most base, which is giving people the information they need to live their lives uh, in lots of levels. But, um, oh dear, I've lost my train of thought. I think I was talking <laughs> about um, what the goal soup. is. The goal for us is to just begin to break down those divides. And, and for me as a journalist, in a democratic society, in democratic societies, we need to be able to talk to one another. That's, that's got to be a founding pr principle. And so um, we don't like work like Kareem is in, in violence zones, but there's verbal violence and hostility and judgment. And so the goal is to begin to soften that. So the idea that I can stand next to someone who has very different views and ideas and engage with them about that in a real way, not in a, in a violent way, a verbally violent way. Does that car carry over, Ethan, into um, your thoughts about Gobo? And like, would people use Gobo to really expose themselves to opposing views, or just to, like many people currently use social media, use it to reinforce the views that they already have? It's interesting. Gobo is a pretty early experiment. It has about 7,000 users at this point. Um, they sort of fall into two camps. There's people who dip their toes into it and sort of go, that's cool, and then step away. And then there's people who really spend a lot of time fiddling with it and sort of trying to adjust it and trying to make it work. I think the main thing that people find is that none of these algorithms work very well. Um, even the algorithms that something like Facebook is using to try to keep you clicking, to try to keep you on it, they're all pretty inexact. And so we're using a lot of those same sorts of algorithms, trying to help people find diversity, trying to help people find different points of view. Mm -hmm. The truth is, in many cases, artificial intelligence just isn't very good yeah. yet. What works better is human beings. Uh, and one of the things that actually works incredibly well for helping people find diverse points of view is a tool like Twitter, where you can simply choose to follow someone who views the world in very different ways. And one of the things I've been trying very hard to do is make sure that my Twitter feed is really rich in people who I either disagree with or who simply have a very different perspective that, than I do and very consciously curate so that I'm not ending up in some of those same filter bubbles that, that sure. a lot of us involuntarily are ending up in. Yeah. And so, Kareem, you, you spoke about wishing to connect people to their shared humanity, even in situations where people are literally killing each other. Mm -hmm. The goal there, um, is it empathy? Empathy for the other? <laughs> empathy for the enemy? Well, <clears throat> we started a project in, in 2015. Excuse me. I've asked everyone in the team not to use the word empathy anymore. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's just empathy carries a lot of things. And we, we, we're just scratching the surface of empathy. You have an amount of empathy in you. That's part of your character. And then there is situational empathy, contextual empathy. Um, empathy can do the opposite of what we think empathy does. I can create empathy for my group here against everyone else here. So it's not really taking the other's position. I've, I've, I've asked the team, and myself included, using a, a term that is much more charged in religion to some extent, but to try to forget that, that aspect. It's compassion. Mm. To be with the other uh, in, in, in a very different way. I think in, in the coming years in science, and this is actually when I was at MIT, I was using empathy all the time at the start. And then someone <laughs> stopped me and says, think about it. I'll explain you something. <laughs> and I stopped using it. I mean, I like the idea, but we're trying to always reduce it to the capacity of stepping in the shoes of the other. And empathy is much more complex than this. And we're scratching the surface and trying to understand what exactly is. And as far as I know, there is seven different kinds of empathy. Seven. Seven. <laughs> Don't ask okay. me to name them all. We're going to go through them one by one. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so I guess 
a natural question would be, given the fact that, for example, your projects, they're not about changing people's minds, nor is yours, really. But what happens when empathy is not enough? What happens when compassion is not enough? So I'm thinking of issues like the climate crisis or your, your work with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You can gain respect and feel compassion and empathy for someone, but as far as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is concerned, there are mutually exclusive points of view. As far as the clim climate crisis is concerned, if I say it doesn't exist, you can think I'm the nicest person in the world and have all seven kinds of empathy for me, <laughs> <laughs> but it does exist. So in some, respect, mi some respects, minds do need to be changed. And I'm just wondering it, how that um, played out in, in your research, Young, and if, people f if you noticed that people felt they could move to another position eventually. Sometimes it can happen, but uh, as I mentioned before, through our conversation, by listening to what the other person is thinking, I don't necessarily change uh, my perspective. And in my research, I discovered that uh, if I have the opportunity to voice my opinion, and if the other person has the opportunity to listen to what I have to say, that's enough, and that's very important. My opinion can be a minority opinion. It never appears on the news. It's something that is always hidden. And if that is so, if in a certain setting I am able to voice my opinion and somebody else is listening to me, then that in itself is meaningful. And uh, it doesn't matter if the other person doesn't agree with me, even at the end of what I have to say. What's important is that I was able to express myself. And even if my opinion is not accepted as a conclusion, I am willing to accept the consensus decision because I was able to voice my opinion. The experience in itself is very valuable, and that's the starting point, I think. Yeah, that makes a, a lot of sense. I just want to add to that it's like um, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about Sisyphus right now because um, you, you, you don't stop trying um, to get to where you want to go even if it's hard. And you, you, we do know from, how, from psychology and, how, and social psychology how people receive information is by, if you bludgeon them, it won't change their mind. So if we want to create change, it begins with relationship. And if we want people to trust us, we have to have relationships. So I, I don't think anything is a, a cure-all, but, but if we want to start engaging those issues and get to the point of changing mind, it's not going to be by you know, ostracizing people. It's going to sure. be by building relationships. So uh, we, keep, we keep trying, right, even if it's not easy. I think we have to get beyond just building the relationships, building empathy, all seven kinds, or <laughs> compassion. <laughs> I, I think we need some common projects. Mm. Um, nice. So uh, for me, uh, th there's, a, there's an argument that mm. Robert Putnam made years ago that part of what's going wrong in the United States is that we're no longer training people to be members of self-governing organizations. When we used to have neighborhood associations, when we had local clubs and people had the chance to be the officer of the club, we learned how to work together on a project, even if the project was as simple as let's have the annual banquet dinner. And as the world gets more professionalized, we don't have the ability to do that anymore. And so we don't learn how to compromise and how to listen. I actually think there's enormous possibility in training people in governing online spaces mm -hmm. and helping them learn in that process how to have that common shared project. And I think what's really hard is as long as these debates are entertainment, as Zainab says, as long as they're a boxing match, then we're never going to work towards the solution. So we have to think instead about how do we get people to do civics that matters? How do we get people to actually work on issues where if they come to compromise, if they come to consensus, it has change in the real world? Until we make those stakes real and until we force people to actually cooperate, it, it doesn't go anywhere. 
And are there metrics that suggest what kind of techniques or what kind of social platforms serve that there's, end? There's all sorts of people trying to change the standards for how we track social media, right? For years, we tracked how long did you spend online, because we just wanted your eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Now we're, we're talking about quality time. Uh, friends like Eli Paris are out trying to come up with metrics for what's a civil conversation. Uh, are you hearing from different points of view? I'd rather just go much simpler. You know, can we point to communities that get together and solve problems? And those problems could be as simple as how do we provide support for people in this conversation? They could be a local question of how do we fix our street or, or how do we throw the party? But I, I think turning social media into something useful and constructive, not just entertaining, sure. would be the, the key change. Eve, I'm curious if you've seen that from the online encounters that you've arranged, whether you've tracked any kind of um, follow-up to that, so some kind of local organizing. I know some of the groups stay together even after the project mm -hmm. is, is over. Does, that ca does the online encounter carry over into the real yeah, world? Yeah, we, we have seen that some, and we've done some um, just simple surveying of attitudinal changes after, so are you, li you know, do you, are you likely to talk to someone who holds different views? Are you um, willing to have conversation with someone? How, what are your attitudes about this person? But we've also seen um, people become friends um, from, from, from the work we've done online. And, and now as in our work, as we start to do marry online and offline um, interactions, we, we, see, we see that taking hold. But I think what you said is really beautiful about, about um, finding ways for people to come together to, to, to serve community. And I'm reminded of, of sort of how local u news used to function in lots of cities and towns. It really was a place where people could come together. It was a letters to the editors. You learned about people's families. You learned about sports and de births and deaths and that kind of connection. If we can find a way to replicate it, um, I think will serve us as a society. Mm. So we just have a, a minute or two left, and I'd like to conclude by asking each of you um, the question that Ethan posed in, in his talk. Um, Ethan spoke about building a kind of public serv service, the social media, and he spoke about um, creating the kind of social media tools that we would like to see instead of receiving them from uh, huge corporations. So I just want to ask each of you briefly, <laughs> um, what would you create if you had um, the resources at your disposal to, to do what you thought would work. I would love to see more education about the world, the digital world. It's coming so fast that people have really a hard time understanding all those tools. Um, at the end of the day, we also kind of lambs, we follow. We, we see where the trend goes and we, we don't ask ourselves too much questions. I think bringing more critical minds and, and, and tools for that would be something very useful. I mean, would give me hope. Ethan? Um, I want to tax on surveillance media. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I want to take money from the companies that are following us around the web, and I want to create a pool of funds that would be available for communities, communities like the one that uh, Ezra al Shafei is serving, to go out and build new tools that meet those needs. And I'd love to create a fund and uh, a technology firm that works directly with communities to help them find tools uh, that actually do the work that, that projects like yours are trying to do. Yeah. Um, I, have, I would like a platform that would allow uh, the hosting of conversation and the infusion of reporting really elegantly with moderation so that it, um, it was a really, it's a really seamless and integrated experience for people. Thank you so much. I think uh, that's a great idea, but I want to give a different answer. I'm working with students, and I'm working on a digital media and democracy project, and that's one of the titles of my lecture. And uh, using the digital platform, how can we develop a community democracy? And it's an experiment that I'm doing through my class. And uh, I'm working on this class together with my students, and what I learned is that using technology well is uh, 
I mean, necessary. But before that, we need to think about the definition of what type of democracy we want and uh, how we can mature as a person in this democracy. And then after that, we have to think about what type of social media and digital technologies we need to use. So I would also, just to conclude, like to ask the same question of all of you today. Um, there have been so many brilliant presenters sharing such great ideas, innovations, broken chicken legs. Um, as you leave here this afternoon, after having um, heard all these wonderful ideas, consider what would you build? Um, or which social media platforms would you take part in? What kind of democracy um, would you like to see evolve? And finally, I just want to thank you uh, for your attention, and please join me in thanking our uh, panelists this afternoon. I thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was good.